Today, 12 things every reefer should know about setting up an Apex Aquarium controller. Well, we wish somebody had told us day one. Before you do a single setup step, pick a mentality that will guide your decisions. I shared my own personal mentality in an earlier video and I learned it from a book called Great by Choice. Be productively paranoid. The only mistakes that you can learn from are the ones that you survive. Successful reefers assume that conditions can unexpectedly change, often violently and fast. They obsessively ask, what if? By preparing ahead of time, they handle disruptions productively, without issue. This is what redundancy, controllers, and monitors are all about. Step one, emulate other successful approaches. The controller's super cool, but it's not a toy. It controls all of the life support systems in the tank. I personally found inspiration from a lot of other successful reefers, but where have you found inspiration from? Also, other successful reefers emulate the success that's come before you. Uh, ask them what they do and how they do it. But I also found successful uh, or success from places outside of the hobby. Uh, one of them was kind of nerdy to say out loud, but it was actually NASA. <laughs> I was looking at how they manage life support there and how that would apply to us because in reality, keeping a human alive in space uh, is a very foreign environment. You know, they have food, heat, water, waste, pollution, all the other things. Same thing with uh, keeping a fish in coral that lives in Fiji uh, in Minnesota or Palm Springs. The desert <laughs> or winter is a very different thing. So it's life support. How do they approach it? And the simple answer to that is system architecture. They design the systems and processes for everything, which in our case would be all the heaters mm -hmm. and pumps and everything that we're going to do. Then they would implement system monitoring because it was worth installing. It was worth knowing whether or not it's working. And then they have, in their case, water controls and uh, atmosphere controls. Yeah. Uh, not all that different from what we're doing. So uh, when you do this, emulate something else, which is somebody else is trying to keep things alive and not just for a week or a year, but like perpetually, like the space station. I want to be able to implement the right system architecture, the monitoring to make sure that it's working and then the controls when it's not. Step two, embrace the concept of redundancy. If everything's going to break and we're going to make mistakes, how can we make it so that it doesn't matter? It's this mindset that will help us make sure we get everything right. Uh, we're sounding repetitive here, but it's important <laughs> because what we're looking at here is you're asking a list of what should I do, but we can't get to that unless you know why you do it. Mm. So this is what we're talking about is why we do it. We're going to make mistakes. The stuff is going to break and we don't want it to matter to us or the fish or coral. Step three, mount it all correctly. Never on the ground, preferably above the water level of the sump. No water freeways for sure. Velcro over those zip ties. Clean is synonymous with safe. Yeah, so the never on the ground bit means never take, whether you're using a controller or a power bar, never just set it on the ground oh. and have the wires going on it. Not even for a single day, because to be honest, you'll probably never come back to mm. it. This is the water freeway that goes in there <laughs> and causes a fire in your house. So uh, never ever, always mount it on the wall. And the reason that you said above the sump is if you put it up on the top here, it's very difficult for water from the sump to travel up. You know exactly uh, but if the water like were the sump were to flood it could go over the edge mm -hmm. and go down so uh also i've never used a zip tie in all of reefing that i didn't regret <laughs> why velcro i personally prefer velcro because i'm constantly one making mistakes and then i'm having to cut all those zip ties and then reinstall them and the velcro just works again and again but the second thing is i i can't be the only one who's done this but I cut those things with scissors and it leaves a little sharp edge. And then when I reach behind my tank, I get these huge gashes in my arm. No joke. Yeah, your zip ties day one looks beautiful. Right? <laughs> I, I haven't been a gash, but I'm sure it happens. Uh, the Velcro though, the ones that I use, uh, you can get them at uh, Home Depot oh. or you know your stock, a big box store. Uh, they have a little tab on the end you can screw a big headed screw into so it'll stay safe. Mm -hmm. And then it uh, has a little strap that goes around it, not unlike this. Velcro, I can take it apart when the, either the, the pump breaks or mm -hmm. needs maintenance, and I can put it back together again without zip tying it all back together. You will never regret using Velcro. You will always regret using zip ties. <laughs> uh, so clean, synonymous with safe, mount it all correctly. That is definitely one of the first steps. Step four, turn on the heartbeat. This is what will actually tell you when everything is down, and it's really the most critical part. And the funny thing is, it's not automatically on when you set up the system. 
So the heartbeat is the power outage monitor, basically sending like little pulses. Hey, are you there? Are you there? <laughs> are you there? And as long as the apex tells fusion, yeah, hey, I'm here. And it's giving you all the parameters like, hey, man, everything's mm -hmm. good. Right. But if it sends those pulses and nobody talks back, most of the time, uh, power outage, right? Mm -hmm. And power outage doesn't mean the whole city has to be out. It could be, in our case, uh, we, uh, the reason one of these big tips here, and wish somebody had told me day one, is uh, in the 750, we lost a ton of fish because the GFCI yep. triggered. It's happened to me. So the power went out to the tank, uh, but we didn't turn on that feature. <laughs> oh, no. So just go in, turn on the heartbeat, and from that point on, power outages will never be your issue. Step number five, decide on what the primary controller is gonna be and then what you want your backup controller to be. This is another one where there isn't like a right or wrong yep. answer. There's a mentality and you should just follow whatever yours is. I'll share my own mentality, but the, what we mean the backup controller is the heater has its own controller. The apex is its own controller. Which one comes first? Because the way you're probably going to set this up is the, you know, the heater turns on and off at 78 degrees. And if for whatever reason it got stuck on, then the next one will stop it from going above 79 or 80 mm -hmm. or wherever you set it. Right. So but what's the first one that's doing all the work? OK, in the open market, I think the average reefer would probably put the most expensive one first. Mm -hmm. Right. Which would probably be the apex mm -hmm. in this case. Uh, my personal take on it is the one that I trust the least goes first. <laughs> the one that's most likely to break goes first the because I need to trust <laughs> the thing that's backing up. So in this case, I would put the heater first and have the heater turn on and off uh, the temperature and then apex would back it up. I wouldn't blame anybody for arguing some other thing. Again, it's the least worst option. There's a debate to be had, but for me, I really can't handle knowing that the crappiest option is <laughs> at last because I won't know if it works when I need it to. I won't trust it. So put it first. Now, it's not just heaters. It's all the other controllers, your pump controllers, your skimmer controller, all those other things that it lights and everything <laughs> that's going on and off. You're going to make individual decisions for each one. It won't necessarily be a universal yeah. answer. So put the most likely to fail first and then the most likely to be there when you need it second. Step number six, stop thinking about these as just outlets. In fact, label them at both the outlet and on the software as to the equipment that's plugged in so you can find it. So rather than being some random outlet, this is the skimmer, this is the light, this is the pump. Historically, this is one of been the biggest setup failures I think that people have done is they use the mentality of I'm going to turn this outlet on and off. How do I program it? It's not an outlet anymore. The moment that I plugged in a protein skimmer, it is now a protein skimmer. Mm -hmm. Stop thinking about it that way uh, and you'll have way better success uh, programming it. And in fact, if this protein skimmer was just hardwired into it, yeah. you would never have thought it about it as an outlet. It's no. not. It's a protein skimmer. How do I get this thing to work most efficiently and safely? And then uh, put a little tag on there. Get one of those little oh. stickers, print out uh, a, a skimmer on the outlet on the outside mm -hmm. so that when you ever need to unplug it or reroute it, you're not like oh, just trying to yes. figure it all out. Same thing in the software. It's no longer outlet number four. <laughs> Relabel the thing as skimmer so you know what you're dealing with. Step seven, uh, the new levels of Apex will actually walk you through the setup mm -hmm. so it's really easy and you can just do a bunch of prompts and it'll set up all the most common gear. Uh, but if for whatever reason you just choose to skip that option uh, and then you're presented with a bunch of outlets, you can go in there, there's options there to configure it for various uh, you know, ORP control or whatever. And you can even do advanced control and like writing code if you want to get really nerdy about it. That is not the way you should do this. <laughs> uh, the easiest possible way is go find the, the menus called tasks. And what we just caught, talked about is a protein skimmer. Well, go find the one that says protein skimmer, hit it, assign the outlet to it, answer just a couple mm -hmm. of questions about uh, what your parameters are in your tank, and boom. It is now set up as a protein skimmer in your tank. There's things for heaters, there's things in there for lights, there's things in there for all, everything. So calibration, all the are just tasks. Oh, yeah. Just go find the task and follow it and it will just set this thing up. This is what we call the 80-20, which is like 20% of the effort, 80% of the benefit, right? Yeah. Just a teeny, teeny little bit where you go, all the benefit. Now, one day, you will get nerdy. Uh, <laughs> one day I want to add like feed lines and all this other stuff and I learned it. You can add that. That's somewhere down the road for you. Uh, but yeah, run the tasks. That's the easiest possible way to do it.
Step number eight, calibrate your probes. That is everything except the ORP. And this is actually really simple because again, it's one of those tasks that's pre-built in. Yeah, so calibrate your pH probe, calibrate your salinity probe, calibrate uh, your temperature probe. That's when a lot of people would skip. Uh, by the way, most of them come with little packets and they yeah. do the task, dip it in there, it'll tell you when it's done, tell you when it's stabilized, super easy. Uh, the temperature one, a lot of people skip. The uh, easiest way to do this is you can buy like a really good thermometer. Uh, Hannah sells one, uh, I think Traceable sells mm -hmm. one, both of them on the BRS website, but really, any thermometer in your house will work. A cooking yeah. one will work. I use my, my meat thermometer all the time. Yes, I mean, I trust it for my food. Uh, in that case, what you're going to want to do, though, is try to find two or three of yes. them and then average them. So those things aren't really designed to be accurate <laughs> no. to the half degree or whatever. So in most cases, we've tested this, and in a vast majority of cases, if you take three sources and average them, it would be really, really close, so close. Yeah, to like the most uh, expensive options out there. Uh, but for me... I actually own the HANA one and the little traceable probe because mm -hmm. I just want to know for, for sure. But calibrate your temperature probe because these things can be off. By quite know? a bit, actually. By, I, I've seen them in, in the heaters by off by like six degrees. That's so much. You know? So 72 or 78 or <laughs> seven, 84. Yeah. So calibrate all this stuff. The only reason you wouldn't want to calibrate the ORP is ORP is just kind of like almost like a mythical thing. Uh, it's Oh, oxygen reduction potential. potential. Potential isn't really a thing. You know? <laughs> uh, it, it, there's no reason for it to be absolute accurate. And you're actually more likely to mess it up than make it better uh, in most cases. So step eight, calibrate all the probes. Make sure everything's reading accurately. Step nine, turn on the power monitoring for each outlet. And I must admit, when I first set mine up, I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah, it's not on by default. So power monitoring for each outlet means that this return pump should be taking 110 watts, right? Uh, but for some reason today, it's only taking 62. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Would you want to know? Because the answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> sure. It is almost always some serious wrong with it. Maybe there's a snail stuck in it. Maybe it's you know all gummed up. It's got full of calcium, all kinds of stuff, and it's about to stop working entirely. Uh, but all of the stuff, uh, the lighting. Now you wouldn't think you'd really care about the power mine and your lighting, but what if it's like 3 a.m. and it's still putting out 300 par because you had a couple beers with your buddies and you turned turn the thing on out. to show the lights and then you forgot to turn it off. <laughs> right. Yeah, I sure would like to know about that. Uh, there's all kinds of reasons, but you have to actually set it up. So you got to go to turn on power monitoring for the outlets. Yeah. In this case, if you actually let it run for like a week, it'll actually give you a window that's safe. Oh, it's so to be easy. In. Yeah. But if you don't want to let it run for a week and you just want to get it done now, plug it in. It'll tell you right on the Watch. interface of Fusion how many watts it's taking, and then just create your own window. Yeah, so running the power mining task, do it. It will save you. Don't do it. You'll regret it. Step 10, simulate failures. That way you can confirm that everything is actually working. I mean, what good does it do to set everything up and then not know that if something goes wrong, that the system's actually gonna work right? Okay, if you use a task, I'm not really all that concerned about this. But if you go nerdy on this oh. uh, and start adding all kinds of really complex thought to it, uh, definitely simulate all the failures. In reality, even if you just Always just simulate the failures. Yeah. It's really, really easy. Take your temp probe, put in a cup of water, <laughs> the temp will fall, uh, the heater should turn on, mm -hmm. uh, put it into a glass of hot water, the, the temp will rise, the heater should mm -hmm. turn off. Uh, you know, simulate a time in there, simulate a, a high pH, low pH, you know, some vinegar yeah, or some soda ash water, whatever it might be. If, if you do that, you can confirm, and you'll actually learn something about how this works and how fast the alarm set off and what happens in each case. So just go through the effort, man. You bought all this stuff and you implement it and you put all the work into it. It's definitely worth knowing what happens when you actually trigger all of these sensors. Step 11, go advanced. Consider your unique system design, and it's gonna be different for every single reefer. How every piece of your equipment goes together, what would happen if they fail, how would you know, and what should happen in that event? I mean, something as simple as adding a second backup heater. You know, how do you exactly do you wanna set it up so if the first one fails, the second one clicks on? I mean, you can actually go super nerdy here and do all sorts of coding, yeah coding, but you know what? You can look it up and there are easy things that you can follow to really make your system as advanced as you want. 
Yeah, two steps, really. Like if I had the two heater thing, yeah. I could set it, use a task, and I could set one up to turn on at 78 degrees and one to turn on at 79, mm -hmm. right? So that like uh, if they failed off, like I know that this one is still working. Yeah. And in a winter state, that might be really important, right? Uh, or in a cold basement, you know? Uh, but also I could get even more, more nerdy and get <laughs> outside the tasks, hit the advanced tab and like, now, oh, what if I want to feed the fish, but I want to do it more intelligently? Yeah. Right now, I could go to the outlet for the power head and in that thing, right? If feed mode A, then off, right? That means that now when I hit the feed mode button, all the power heads are going to turn off yeah. and all that food is going to be there for all the fish to get instead of going down the overflow. You know, and this right? isn't only just an advanced thing. Like, for example, I haven't done this yet on my Apex. So I go through and I turn off all the individual things. And it's happened to me before where I've forgotten to turn one of them back on. But if you go advanced, you can make sure that they'll always come back on. Yeah, that feed mode, you could be yeah. used like feed mode D, turn off for 30 minutes essentially, yeah. right? Uh, and then it'll automatically come back on. It hits that bit we were talking mm -hmm. about, show uh, my buddies the lights, you know? <laughs> exactly. like, like this is the dummy proof version. Turn on for 15 minutes to show my buddies, turn off when I leave, it's all done. So you can definitely go advanced and that would be step 11. After you got all the other stuff down, as time goes on, learn more about it and then do some really cool stuff. Step number 12, go even more <laughs> advanced. Consider how the new system can actually make your life easier. Testing, water chemistry, dosing, fresh water top off, auto water changes, maintenance modes. Through. I mean, you can go on and on to make your life easier. Again, historically, this was the way that, like why controllers what? are valuable. We use them for different reasons today, but now, once you have that, you have this whole like ecosphere mm. of stuff that makes your life easier. Like you don't like dosing by hand, don't have to anymore in the dose. Uh, you don't like auto top offs, you know, there's an auto top off solution. Uh, you don't like testing, well, we have the out of the box, you know, you can do a salinity, pH, yeah. ORP, but now you can even do calcium, alkalinity, and, uh, uh, and magnesium. Not only do it every day, but also track it and we give you graphs of trends. You know, there's so many different things. And in fact, even door lights, like you can set it up. So oh. if I open my cabinet, lights underneath just come I on need automatically. That. I need that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I can even do uh, uh, like switches, like toggle switches, where if I want to do maintenance, I can do flip the yeah. adaptive reef uh, like uh, like jet plane That's switch, right. and all of a sudden <laughs> the lights turn off, the return pumps turn off, the a uh, the uh, UV turns off, all of the stuff turns off uh, except for what I still need on and then just turn it back all on. Instead of going in like unplugging every last thing <laughs> or you know toggling every last thing off, I can do some really, really cool stuff. So step 12, go even more advanced. By the way, most of that stuff is a task. Okay, we're finally to my number one setup tip and this is for everybody out there. Don't finalize your wire management for at least a week or two. Whenever you're setting up a new system, and I've set up so many new systems, I'm always super jazzed about it, and I put all the wire management, I get all the Velcro straps, all the cord management stuff, and then eventually, three, four days later, I'm like, oh, I need to add that one thing, or I need to upgrade that, and then I have to redo all of it. So you know what? If you can handle just mounting everything and maybe waiting a week or two to finalize it, you will only have to do it once. Okay, so this is one that is absolutely true. Somebody should have told me day one, I violate it constantly. <laughs> I can't help it. I, I want know. to OCD it right, immediately perfect, but every time you're right, I come back and make changes. So uh, follow his advice and you'll be happier. All right, my number one setup tip, uh, if you only heard one thing today, broken record alert, the more productively paranoid you are, productively is the word there, it's important, <laughs> uh, the more prepared you are for conditions that can unexpectedly change violently and fast, you and your tank will be here to tell the tale. <laughs> All right, you learned something unexpected about setting up your controller. There's more in our controllers did you know playlist right here, and new episodes of BRS TV released every Monday and Friday.